you can join our project Exoplanet Watch. You can observe transits and exoplanets using your telescope. We have people contributing to our project with telescopes as small as four inches, about 10 centimeters. You can make scientifically impactful measurements. I'd like you to say hello to our guest astronomer, Rob Zellum. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. Yes, Rob, you're going to be telling us how the folks can help NASA's James Webb Space Telescope study the planets around other stars, aka exoplanets. Yeah, exactly. And exoplanets are planets outside of our solar system. We now know of over 5,000 today. And we now think that due to uh, ground and space-based telescopes, there are as many planets in the sky as there are stars. So planets are everywhere. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. I didn't realize that. Although it's also fascinating, the term exoplanet, because it always makes me think of ex-wife. It's like, you have 5,000 exes? No, exos, Phil. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's just short for extrasolar. So extrasolar meaning outside of our own solar system. So an exoplanet is any planet that's outside of the eight in our solar system, because as we all know, Pluto is not a planet. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, those are exoplanets. Pluto is an exoplanet. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> slight, slight differentiation there. Now, Rob, where are you calling from? So I'm calling from Monrovia, California. It's a little town about 10 miles east of Pasadena, where I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles. Ah, uh, yes. JPL. Exactly. Now, Rob, I understand that you're a Star Wars fan, which seems pretty on point for someone who's an astronomer. It's almost a job requirement at this point. But yeah, I, I've loved Star Wars. Um, my parents are huge into it, and they early indoctrinated me from an early age as well. And it's just sort of this, this love of, of space and space travel and thinking about, you know, perhaps there's spaceships or humans or alien life out there in the universe just made me just roll that interest into them pursuing as a career. So now I'm an astronomer looking for potentially alien life out there, or at least places where alien life could potentially live today. <laughs> or just planets with two suns. <laughs> exactly. So actually, we have discovered a few Tatooines. One of them is really famous. It's Kepler-16, and it actually was the first sort of Tatooine ever discovered. Um, unfortunately for Luke Skywalker, he can't look at the sunset angstily because he didn't get to go <laughs> to the... Uh, the Tashi station to pick up some power converters because the planet that's orbiting around those two stars is actually a Jupiter-like planet. So a really big planet. It's also orbiting fairly close, so it's fairly warm and hot. Mm. Um, and we actually observed this planet with the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, mm. unfortunately, Luke is probably not there, but um, we know a few of other planets that orbit around two stars. So perhaps there are some angsty teenagers out there too. <laughs> that's incredible. That's wild. I love the fact that your childhood interest is now your adult interest. And yeah, speaking exactly. Speaking of your adult, adult interests, let's talk about Exoplanet Watch. Yeah, so Exoplanet Watch is a citizen science project to have um, folks using their own telescopes or robotic telescopes to help us observe exoplanets. So uh, one of the methods we use to detect and study exoplanets is called the transit method. So the transit method is when we're observing a star, a planet can actually pass in front of the star and block out the star's light. And the amount of light that the planet blocks out from the host star directly tells us how big the planet it is relative to its host stars. The bigger the planet, the more light that's blocked out, the dimmer the star gets, the smaller the planet, the smaller the dip in brightness. And this method has been used to discover um, a majority of the known exoplanets today but it also importantly allows us to study the atmosphere of an exoplanet. We can actually look at how when the planet passes in front of the star, we can analyze how the atmosphere blocks out and absorbs some of the star's light. And from that, we can actually infer the molecules that are in that planet's atmosphere, or you know, if it has, um, you know, what sort of temperature it might have in its, its atmosphere as well. So we can actually learn a lot from the transit method. But in order to use the transit method, we need to have that star, that planet pass right in front of its star. We have to know very precisely when that transit event will occur. 
And this transit event, uh, this method is actually being used currently today on the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as the James Webb Space Telescope. And we're using this right now to characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets. And we're also looking forward not only to the, the present with Hubble and James Webb, but also the near future with European Space Agency mission uh, called Ariel, which is dedicated to looking at transit events, be looking at hundreds, if not thousands of planets. And then beyond that, it's my opinion that we'll probably have the transit uh, method around for a while and we'll be continuing to observe it, to use it to observe and characterize exoplanets. But in order to do that characterization, we have to observe that transit event. So we have to know somewhat precisely when that transit will occur. So let's pretend I have a favorite exoplanet and I write to the folks that control Hubble or James Webb and I say, please give me some time to observe this exoplanet. I wanna observe this specific transit. I have to know very specifically when that event will occur. So what I'll do is I'll go online, I'll look at what pre previous folks have published in the literature to estimate when that transit timing event will occur and I'll try to build in some overheads if there's any uncertainty in the event. But I always run a risk. If there is a large uncertainty in that transit event, I could do one of two things. I could hope for the best and hope that I, I happen to pick the right time. I could also build in some additional overhead. So you know, give, it, give our observations some more padding on either side of the transit event to make sure the guarantee that I'll hit that event. Or I can do some pre-imaging from you know, ground-based telescopes to help us get some observations so we can better predict when the next transit occurs. The problem with building an additional overhead is that it's not really in a very efficient use of these resources. Everyone wants to rightly so use Hubble and James Webb. They're amazing instruments and the entire astronomy community is basically, you know, fighting for, for, the, for the time. It's very few and far between, it's very precious. And this is exactly where citizen scientists can join and help us out you can join our project exoplanet watch you can observe transits and exoplanets using your telescope we have people contributing to our project with telescopes as small as four inches about 10 centimeters you can make scientifically impactful measurements you can help us refine these times and you can help us use these resources a lot more efficiently which means perhaps maximize science output from these really precious resources that's, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, you're talking about this transit thing, which I'm sure has happened as long as, to some degree, as people have been looking up in the sky, but the level of technology increasing and the fact that you can now measure the how much light the planet blocks and, and let that, you know, tell you about its atmosphere is so incredible. And yeah. with, with the, the James Webb Space Telescope up there, has it made uh, new discoveries, you know, in the infrared? Yeah. So the reason we're so excited about the James Webb Space Telescope is it apply or it gives us additional wavelength coverage, but also since this mirror is so much larger than the Hubble Space Telescope, it gets us a lot more precision. So if you look at this picture, of James Webb right here, uh, this bottom purple thing is its uh, sun shield, its solar shield, and that's the ah. size of a tennis court. So okay. this primary mirror is so much larger than Hubble that it allows us to collect a lot more particles of light, allowing us to get to smaller signals, higher fidelity measurements, uh, things that are more precise. And James Webb has an expanded wavelength coverage. So right now we're limited by Hubble, what we're able to, to achieve to probe basically on the wavelengths of light that we can actually look at. And James Webb helps expand that out. And the reason that's so important is because this allows us to access additional molecules in that planet's atmosphere. So this is one of the many reasons we're really excited about the successful launch and operations of James Webb is because we'll have better measurements, both in their signal to noise ratio, their precision, but also their wavelength coverage, which will give us a lot more constraints on these planet's atmospheres. Oh, wow. All right. Now, Folks out there, if you want to learn how Rob and other astronomers actually image these exoplanets that we're discussing, be sure to click subscribe and watch out for our next video. And also, check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to send us your astronomy-related questions via DM or just in the comments. Okay? 